Hi guys, this is Michael from the Board Games Chronicle. Recently I had the pleasure to play a lot uh, Mark Herman's Rebel Fury and I really think this is a great game uh, I am having a lot of fun with this. Uh, I already created the unboxing and first look at uh, material which you can see down below uh, in the link uh, in the description side. What I would like to do today, I thought after those several games, is to create a material in which I will show you guys how to play this game. Maybe I will not go through each and every small rule in the rulebook, but more so um, like the flow of the game. Uh, I will concentrate on the spirit of the game, you might say, yeah, how, how the designer wanted and what he wanted to, 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 to convey here. Um, so definitely, if you are thinking if this is a game for me, should I invest in it? Will I like it? After this material, you should have this, this feeling. And, and uh, this, is, this is my goal. After that, I will do what I was doing, for example, for a Pacific War. We will be playing consecutively all the scenarios which are presented by this game. I believe uh, the best way to learn a game and to see how it plays is to see it in action. So kind of a teach and play. Uh, today I set up the Fredericksburg scenario as a, let's say, material which will uh, help me to show you the rules. It's the first scenario in the game. And this is a main solitary affair because uh, Two player will not be much fun, especially for the union side. You know, it's it's like like uh, disastrous uh, campaign for them. Uh, but this would be enough here yeah, to, to to show you the game elements. Uh, we'll go through such big things like uh, you know sequence of play. We talk about the components, about key concepts. I like it that we have such a section in the rulebook key concepts. We talk about movement, attack, <clears throat> also other phases. It'd be important for you guys to understand how we determine victory. There are a couple of ways to do it. And uh, of course, uh, yeah, um, that will conclude this theoretical part, but pretty soon I will start shooting a set, uh, session, session report. So I believe we can start. Uh, just a reminder, Rebel Fury, game from Mark Herman, uh, volume one in the Civil War Heritage series, <coughs> covers six scenarios, six battles. Uh, Fredericksburg is the first one, and then we have a six, a, a five farther. <coughs> that one is mainly solitary. The other five are very good solitary and two player yeah, titles. Um, interesting thing, we have three maps and each map can accommodate two battles. Very, very uh, nice, nice approach. Let me start from a very, very high level. This is, of course, Hex and Counter game. We have a map where we have, you know, all the features of the, of the terrain, roads, rivers, woods, hills, and so on. We have tokens with which we'll be playing on both sides. <clears throat> to this, we have player aid, off-board map, some additional tracks which will be helping us. To this, we are adding a couple of dice which will be uh, resolving the battles and also determine, determining their results or consequences of a particular battle. And that's, in essence, everything. There is a couple of more counters which are like uh, markers. From the sequence of play, and by the way, uh, rule book which you have has a very nicely put the sequence of play here. There are actually four phases in this game. And uh, let me briefly go through them so you have a broad understanding of a gameplay. First of all, you have a command phase. Command phase, kind of a phase in which you actually set up the things for the coming turn, uh, allows you to, first of all, uh, define the initiative. Um, it's time when you redeploy your uh, headquarters. You can see the headquarters here. Uh, you can also place detachments, such as small things like, oh, small tokens and also there could be a off map movement and and things like that so all in all this is a uh, this is um, the phase in which you prepare for your strategic goals to be achieved during the next turn uh, especially 
as far as the HQs are concerned. But, so this is a command phase. Second phase is organization phase. So, so it is clearly organize, organizing your units, like you determine the formation of your divisions, some of the blown divisions are coming back, you know, you can disengage and then you can also construct field works. So the second phase, organization phase, is more focused on the units and their preparation for the turn. Command phase is like strategic preparation for the turn. I would say organization phase is more like, you know, tactical preparation for the turn. Then you have a movement phase, then you have the attack phase, and that's all. End of turn. You see? This is a very, very simple, straightforward set of, uh, you know, phases. So command, organization, movement, attack, and of course, end phase when you, you can do some cleanup uh, through which you go. Depending on scenario, it will be from three turns for Frederiksburg up to, wow, this is like 10 here and 10 here, yeah. yeah. Uh, in those two scenarios, uh, Chancellorville and Spotsylvania, yeah, they have like them. Each turn is half a day. It's very simple, it's simply half a day. So if we have three turns, it's like one and a half day. If we have three, 10 turns, that means it's five, five days. So as I said, pretty straightforward sequence of play. And usually the scenarios does uh, skip uh, when they start, they usually skip phase one, phase two. So you immediately jump to the movement phase and the attack phase. Yeah, it's not always like this, but but usually that's that's how it how it goes. So we we have now the general understanding of what the game is about and how it's being played from a sequence of uh, play perspective. Let us now move to the components. For the components, one thing which I would like to say before we jump into detail is that I like them very much. I like the beautiful map by Rick Barber. Beautiful, simply outstanding. It's it's really nice, clearly, you know, uh, easy to read, clearly visible with everything. Also very nicely done tokens and thematic additional, additional you know, uh, things. So from the components, where should we start? Most probably we should start with a map. As I said, there are three maps. Each and every one of them accommodates two battles. They are different. There is a very nice player aid, which shows us all the terrain types. And guys, honestly, there are not too many of them. There are roads, there could be railways, but there could be also unfinished railway, but this is only for thematic purposes. You will have woods, you will have big rivers, you will have some runs and creeks. Yeah, do we have any creek here? There should be somewhere. Yeah. So runs and creeks. Uh, other than that, we have open terrain, of course. Here, slopes. There will be also um, entren uh, entrenchments, which could be on the map, written, uh, already put on the map, or in the next volumes in the series, it would be possible to, 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 to erect them. And I believe it's all. Oh, here we have a railway. Yeah, I thought that. Uh, town, Fredericksburg, there is, there is only two towns on the three maps. Yeah, so, so this is not a predominant terrain. The predominant terrain, which you will see on those maps, it will be usually woods and rivers, and will be uh, really uh, impending any attack, attack abilities. Mm. When we are already with the player aid, so let me stay with this, the player aid show all the terrains, uh, the explanation, the impact on formation, we'll talk about formation in a moment, compact effect, and uh, zone, co zone of control, zone uh, of of uh, ZOE, ZOC, so uh, both zones which will be actually um, a key element of a game. I have not touched upon this, so so give me a moment. I, I will go there in a moment. Uh, yes, so map player eight. I believe we should show you also the counters, uh, which is very important. So we have a couple of types of counters. Let me take several of them. Those are Divisions. Divisions are the big counters. There could be infantry division and there could be also the cavalry division. On the counters, you will see, first of all, the denomination 
to which scenario this counter is attached to. I really like this concept and I cannot praise it enough. You can really quickly set up each and every scenario by simply looking for the counters which are used in this scenario. So uh, I even sorted them out yeah, here for each and every scenario. So we can easily grab them, two sets for each battle and one set here for Fredericksburg. But you know, guys, this is this is wonderful. This is something which I was really looking forward to in many games, and and, and now we we have it. Uh, what else do we have on those counters? Let me take something which I will be able to show you the details with. Okay, Twitter seems like a good solution, I believe. Okay, so what do we have here? Here uh, we would have a designation of a scenario, I told you. Here we have a setup hex. In the middle we can see what type of uh, um, division it is. Uh, you will also see the name, here the name of the division and the corp to which it's um, attached to. In Fredericksburg, actually, the Union Corp will, Corps uh, are slightly differently done. You have re, uh, left, right, and center, but usually you would have corps, yeah, yeah, but, uh, that way. And uh, for the Confederate Army, this would be mainly the numbers, if I remember, and the names for the Union ones. Just checking what else should I show you? Ah, of course. Battle stars. You can see that here we have two battle stars, here we have one, here we have zero. This is show how uh, elite the unit is. The number here, the only number, the only number which actually counts on the counter is a movement allowance. And on that side, all of those units are in the, but in the maneuver formation. If you will flip them, you see that they are in the battle formation, ready to fight, and their movement allowance is decreased to one. This would be one of the key concepts we'll be talking about, yeah, but each and every formation has two sides. So, these are those three, okay. We have also on the map something called detachments. They are, they are, these are small, one-sided, we just stay and, and, and guard particular area. And we have also, only on the Union side, the heavy artillery tokens, which will be, you know, concentrating fire uh, during during particular part of the scenario and of the map, because they cannot, cannot move. Uh, we have also, of course, HQs. These are two types, no, two sides of HQ. So we have in General Lee and uh, General Burnside. And what we can see here, first of all, of course, designation of a scenario, picture, setup hex, TBD means to be de defined, decided, yeah, exactly. Then we have the name of the army. This is purely for the, you know, flavor. Then we have uh, the name. Colors, of course, show which side this is, and then we have the range. This is the side of uh, mm, of uh, uh, commanding officer of HQ, which is on its maneuver side. So its commanding range is 1512. And if we flip it, you will see that this is a battle uh, uh, formation side. So the, the range is smaller, but now. Uh, there are um, uh, stars which the uh, leaders can contribute to the, to the actual fight. And if they contribute to, them to the fight, they can die. Yeah. So let me put them back more or less where they were. So these are the counters. As I told you, we have dice. We have... Uh, 10-sided die for the Union and for the Confederate, and one red die which you roll when you um, do the retreat uh, during the fight from the defensible terrain. You can be blown or you can simply retreat. Yeah. Two things can happen then. Uh, this is, yeah, uh, this is 10-sided this is die, and zero is zero. 
simply zero is zero. Remember, and this is very, very nicely put also in the rules. By the way, I love the rules by Mark Hellman. They are always a pleasure to read. Uh, for the components, we're talking about counters, map, uh, player eight. Okay, two more things. We have uh, off map display. In this first volume, it's only for the union. Uh, yeah, mm, these are the circles are off map spaces. The hexes are the entry spaces. So, for example, in this volume, only the this map has off map part, and you can see, for example, K here is K here. So, it's more or less like this. This is the edge of the map to which we have all those entry spaces. Yeah, this is this is it. And so there is a possibility for union forces to be off map and then they will be entering the map during the scenario. And we have uh, also, I would say, uh, one, 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 one sheet with the tracks. And what we will be counting here? First of all, we'll be counting the turns of a particular scenario. And then we have uh, two tracks from zero to nine for three things which we will be tracking, uh, for two things which we'll be tracking during the game. So remaining moves and attacks, because in this game, uh, only once one side is passing, the other uh, will be having some set of additional moves of attacks after this. And the other is how much ammunition you have. This is two-sided, so there's plus 10, yeah? So, and you will be tracking. Usually they start with a lot of ammunition, 19, the maximum, but not all scenarios. Some of them start, for example, at 14 or a different number. And this is used only when one side, uh, you know, passed, as I said. Or in the solo scenario of Fredericksburg, you also will be given some set number of, of, of movements, which you will mark here. And then, okay, I have 14, I can move with it. I'm also using this uh, to store, for example, detachments and other additional stuff which might be needed, like uh, heavy artillery, bombardment, hexes, and so on. And I believe that covers all the components of the, of the game. Now, we are ready to move to the next part. We'll be talking now about the key concepts and when you read the uh, Rebel Fury rulebook, what I really like is that the first thing you, which you can see is, of course, setup in, in explanation of the tokens, but then it immediately starts with the key concepts and definitions. And let us now talk about those four key concepts. First key concept is that in this game, you have two types of zones, zones of control and zones of influence. Such big hex, so division has both zone of control and zone of influence. Zone of control is uh, around uh, it, and zone of influence is adjacent to zone of control. And a small detachment has only zone of control. It will have a huge impact on the behavior of the enemy units, because as you might expect, big units, big divisions will have influence on much broader uh, uh, much broader area, and uh, that way uh, it will uh, it will uh, impact and influence our other units. Second key concept, which we already described, is that uh, Rebel Fury does not have a traditional movement, but it uses hexes movement. And divisions can be in two formation: the maneuver formation or the battle formation. And that means how many hexes they can move, or movement points they have. And this is also, so you see this radical reduction uh, between, between ones, uh, those two. Mm. When it changes, it changes in a couple of situations. Let me assume that we have such situation. And this is now the phase of the, uh, of the, of the uh, uh, confederate. This unit, when it moves on the road, it ignores all other, you know, uh, terrain types. Uh, this is also road, remember. But if it enters the hex with the defensible terrain, rough terrain, 
it will immediately flip to the battle mode and it will stop. So that means that simply uh, the, the terrain makes it stop. If it enters the zone of influence or zone of control of the unit, so from here to here, it also has to stop and change to the battle formation. If we would have a detachment here, it can come here, and if it goes here, it goes into zone of control of this unit and has to flip. This is a very important concept in the game <coughs> of this uh, two sides, maneuver formation and battle formation, and uh, this moving from one to the other. Important thing, you cannot change from the battle formation to maneuver formation during the movement phase. So if you changed here in the movement phase, you need to check, uh, to need to wait to the next turn uh, formation determination step. So to the next turn and see whether you are in zone of control or influence of the enemy unit. If not, you can flip. Okay, um, so this is very important concept number two. Concept number three, uh, the only units which can move in the Rebel Fury are the divisions. Detachments stay in place, HQs stay in place, pontoon <laughs> bridges of course stay in place, but only, only those units can move. And the movement phase, as we shall see in a moment, is done, uh, you know, um, as a series of alternative moves by, by each side. Fourth co key concept is only divisions that are in an enemy zone of control, so something like this, can attack. And importantly, uh, we'll see it later on, that this has to be infantry, infantry divisions who can uh, fight other divisions. Um, cavalry divisions will have some, uh, some, some, some um, restrictions uh, for this. Detachments never attack, but they can actually defend. One of the uh, two differentiators regarding the range. In order to move, the unit has to move within the range or towards the range of HQ, but for the attacks, they don't have to be in the range. So yeah, that's that's how it how it works. Okay, so the key concepts are discussed. Mm, now I believe we can move to the next point. It will be movement. Movement we discussed already to some extent, but let me repeat it and let me explain it a bit once more. And also the special cases of the movement, which we will have here. Let me just open the rule book, not to omit anything which is important. Okay. In order to move, the unit uh, doesn't have to be in the command range of, the, of the, uh, its, its HQ, but if it's not in the command range of its HQ, it has to finish its move closer to this HQ than it was at the beginning of the movement. So for example, if we have such situation, Lee has now six hexes of, uh, um, of the range. So if we activate this unit, it has to finish its movement closer to this uh, than, than it, it's, it was before. So it's going for one, two, three, four, ignoring all of those hexes uh, the terrain. But it can also do the extended move because if it doesn't enter enemy zone of control or zone of influence during the movement, it can move uh, double its uh, printed you know movement allowance. So one, two, three, four, five, and we'll have to stand he stop here because here we have zone of influence of Howard already. But it already moves, moved, of course, uh, more. It can also move one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that way. As I was showing already, if a unit moves into an Amazon of influence, it has to stop and flip to the battle formation. In its next move, it might move closer to the enemy, and if it closes into its zone of control, the enemy also has to flip to the battle formation, and now they are both in enemy zone of control, and they cannot be activated to the, uh, for the move. Interestingly, and this is the huge innovative concept in this game, interestingly, uh, you don't have 
set limit of units you can move. You don't have terrain costs. You don't have all of those traditional you know, solutions. What you do, you alternate your move. So union move, let me move them here. Uh, for example, now we have uh, uh, a rebels move that they would like, for example, to escape. They will move here or even farther. They are closer to the, to the, to the um, uh, HQ. And this is exactly how this game plays. One side moves, the other side moves. One side moves, the other side moves. Uh, the HQs are limiting what you, how you can do this move. You can do whatever you want within the range. If you are outside of the range, you need to get closer. If you are getting into the enemy zone of control, or if you are entering the hex, which is uh, marked in the, uh, in the terrain effect charts as a formation effect, ch a formation change, you have to change, and then you will move uh, slower. In your uh, movement phase, you can move only one division, and the movement allowance is, of course, connected with its formation. If it's in maneuver formation, it has a lot of movement options. If it's in the uh, battle formation, it can only move one, or on the road to, if not entering an zone of controls or influence. Very interesting mechanic. And if you add to this that you do not have a full control over those HQs because if you commit the HQ to the battle formation, you might not be able to reposition it the next turn. It depends on the situation on the dice hole. If you have the HQ in the maneuver formation, you will be able to redeploy it to some other space. But if you commit to the fight, you might not be able to, to, to simply move this HQ. So this is this is very interesting mechanic which we will be having here. Okay, let me do a small cleanup before we move to most important thing which you all probably are waiting for before we move to the combat. Okay guys, let's continue. Now we will focus on the attacks. Attacks phase is after the movement, so we did all the moves. Let us try to do some example of what will be going on. Let me assume such situation. Mm -hmm. We'll do some simulation. Mm, it would be good to have also some HQs, let's say in a battle formation on the other side. So this would be our example. and. Of course, it has also to be in the battle formation. So we have two divisions. Uh, uh, this is divisions of Maclows, A and B. This is divided into two, uh, two counters because this was such a big division. This is an elite division. Yeah, and they will be attacking the regular division of Birnay. Uh, we will have uh, HQs nearby to better depict the example and uh, to show what will be going on. Now, you see those two tokens, I have not spoken about them. They show whether you commit or not commit artillery support during, during the attack. And this is exactly what you'll be doing in the first uh, step of the attack sequence. Everybody secretly will hide what he decides, then we will do the flip and we'll see which side uses the, the um, artillery. If uh, any side uses artillery, he will be deducting it here. So you, of course, can calculate how many attacks or defenses you can support with the artillery. So this is the first step of the attack procedure. So uh, determine the artillery support. Then we will need to determine battle rating. And battle rating determination is a procedure where you calculate simply how much you have of a battle rating. Then each side will determine their tactical position. Tactical position is determined by a die roll, which takes into account your battle rating. You roll a die, and then you have a tactical position. The tactical positions are very straightforward and understandable. Significant advantage, advantage, disadvantage, significant disadvantage. Both sides uh, determine this when we resolve the attack result because both sides have some value here. You look at the attack result table, attacker tactical position, 
defend their tactical position. And the last step is, of course, before we conduct the pursuit, is we look here at the result with some explanation. Tell you about this in a moment. It will implement this and we potentially uh, put uh, do, do the pursuit. So the essence of the game is the tactical position of the unit, not the strength of the unit. You don't have strength points here in this game. You have simply tactical positions which will give you benefits. And your tactical position is the better battle rating you have, the better tactical position. And we should now focus on this step number uh, number two. Each side determines their uh, uh, battle rating. And we do it with a player aid. Now, what I will be explaining now, you might think it's daunting and it's a lot of stuff to remember. No, guys, during the end of the first scenario I played, I was doing it from the top of my head, really. Uh, it, it's not difficult, it's, it's really pretty easy and straightforward. How do we calculate battle rating? And you know what? We will do it that way, but I will use the dice here to show you where we are with the battle rate. Uh, attacker is McClough, and defender is Birney. First of all, attacker and defender begins with a battle rating of 1. So they both are at 1. Now, artillery support. Let's assume that both sides would like to have artillery support. They use one artillery ammunition point. We add three to the artillery uh, for the attacker. We add four to the defender. So defender is at battle rating five and attacker is battle rating four. Now, uh, if there is this heavy artillery and we have such, such a special counter put during uh, earlier phases, like here, this counter actually adds here and on adjacent Mm, hex is additional free to the battle rating. But this is a really rare thing. Artillery, it's mainly plus three for attacker, plus four for defender. Then we have defender terrain modifier. We look here, we see whether it's defensible terrain. If it's defensible terrain, plus three battle rating. Where do they stand? They stand in the woods. So yes, their battle rating moves to eight. Now, Another thing we take into the account, uh, this is only for defender, leadership battle stars, both attacker and defender. If attacking defending division is within the command range of a friendly HQ in the battle mode, the attacker defender may add one such HQ's but, uh, uh, battle stars. So we add one here and we have two only, so we add two. Uh, the maximum battle rating is 10, so we have not yet reached the 10. Then troop quality, attacking and defending division adds its battle stars. These are, uh, let's assume this is attacking. These are very elite units, so we have plus two on the battle stars. Now, what X do, uh, next do we have here? Uh, we have uh, attack support, attacker adds two. If there is a friendly division in both attacker and defender zone of control. So you see, this guy has a colleague who is in his zone of control and enemy zone of control, which adds him too. So he actually reached already 10. And there's another addition, corpse division integrity. Attacker defender adds one for corpse division integrity. The division integrity means that there is adjacent to your unit from your from the same corpse or division. Yes, my clothes they are from the first corp and, and, and that's actually work. In such situation, we have hood here and for example, I don't know, early here. Uh, they will still add two to the, uh, to the attack support because there is a unit in both um, um, zone of controls of the attacker and defender and division integrity because there is adjacent unit here. So we need to always check whether there is attacker support, uh, attack support and whether there is division integrity. Division integrity would work also for those guys if we would have, for example, center, center, where do I have C? We pull. If we would have search situation, they will also add one uh, to, the, to the battle rating. 
And if you fight versus detachment, attacker adds four if defender is detachment without a division. It's simply detachment is small, much easier to be crushed yeah, and destroyed. Okay, so in this case, we arrived at 10 attacker uh, battle rating. So this is that column and nine this is that column of the defender. Let me use my die thrower device. Okay, let me use it maybe here. Okay, you should see it nicely. So what we'll do now, we'll roll first attacker then defender and we'll see where we will land. Okay, five. Five is significant advantage, so let me put it here, significant advantage. And now the defender, they rolled two on the nine, which is advantage. So this is here, and now we cross reference. We have defender retreat with some special case. If defender in fort or entrenchment, defender eliminated because they were trying to defend to the last man. If defender in defensible terrain or field works, roll 1d6, this is fed, and uh, we will blow the defender or maybe it will retreat. Okay, they are lucky, they will retreat. They retreat up to three hexes. If uh, they retreat through the rough terrain, uh, they can retreat only, only two hexes. I believe so. Now, what would mean that if they are blown? If they are blown, they are removed from the map and put two turns farther, and they will come back. However, if you are, for example, in turn two, it's not possible. So they will be dead. You put them to the dead pile because you will be counting and calculating how many units you actually destroyed on the enemy side. There is something called... Uh, mandatory attack couple of them the most common uh, is if you have enemy in the entrenched position so if you have for example this unit here this would be a mandatory attack which has to be resolved during the uh, incoming uh, attack phase yes mm -hmm. checking if i should point anything out. Yeah, so in this case, when those guys were retreating, we can, we have to pursue. And if we are, special rule, in the uh, range of uh, um, uh, HQ with the two stars, we can move even one more hex. And that would be pursuit. And if we would roll, uh, I believe, uh, it was zero or nine. Mm -hmm. Yep. So each side rolls one D ten. Uh, okay, exactly. Uh, if a tactical position die roll is zero or nine, you would have casualty here. So. This is tricky using those, those uh, uh, units in the fight. On the other hand, they are so much needed. Yeah, they are so much needed. Uh, so, indeed, uh, this is very important to have them at hand. Okay, I think I will stop here with the attack resolution. That's enough. Let's move to the next part. I believe this will be the last one. Let's talk now about the victory and how do, do we determine victory. There are two types of victories in the game. They are very nicely put in the rulebook, so let's focus on this here. Okay. First type of victory is generalship victory. This victory stems out from the number of units you managed to destroy on the enemy side. You are getting three points for each division and one point for each detachment. And if your VP difference is uh, seven or less, you have tactical generalship victory. If it's eight or more, it's operational VP victory. Eight points is three divisions, two divisions, and two detachments. It's more or less this 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 um, difference. Now. Uh, 
strategic victory is something specific to each and every scenario. And strategic victory usually uh, is connected with some geographical uh, fit to accomplish. For example, connect, make sure that there is a connection, I don't know, from this hex to this hex uh, via railways and roads without enemy zone of controls. Something like, like this, or reach this and that uh, fort or pontoon bridge, have a an, an, uh, zone of control there and prevent the enemy from getting the strategic victory. Actually, uh, in, in um, each and every battle, you would have it nicely pointed out. Yeah, general ship victory per the rules, so here, but the strategic victory versus specific for each of the sides. So this is this is how you do it. Pretty straightforward again. You can you can win uh, either this way or this way. Strategic victory always overrules general ship victory. Why? You might um, commit a lot of forces to gain a strategic victory to gain, you know, this geographical connection and lose a lot of troops in the process. So you might be on the minus with generalship, but if you manage to achieve a strategic victory, you still are rewarded for this. So, you know, if there would be only this type of victory, everybody would be, you know, afraid of attacking because they would think, okay, I attack, I lose a unit, I will lose the game. No. You are encouraged to fight and to actually achieve strategic victory regardless of the losses. Okay, there are also some additional rules which I'm not, you know, touching upon today. I believe uh, the, the number of the rules which I already presented today here, the flow of the game, the sequence of play, the components, the key concepts, the movement attack phase, are all those things are really, really important. One thing which I haven't touched upon are HQs. I will show this in details in my examples of play for of the scenarios, which will be uh, happening uh, pretty soon. This is the best way to show them on the actual play. You've seen how important it is for HQ to be um, on the map, for your units to be able to move, for your units to be able to, to, to uh, fight effectively. Imagine that you cannot relocate such HQ because something happened. You rolled badly, you committed. That will have a huge impact on your gameplay. And we will show this in the actual examples of play. For today, I will conclude here. Thank you very much for being with me. Thank you for uh, uh, listening, for watching. Uh, if you like this this material, please give thumbs up. Uh, if you'd like to see more content like this, kindly please subscribe. Also, feel free to use the comment section below video to point out any anything, maybe some inaccuracies which I made, maybe some comments, maybe some opinions. There will be more content about Rebel Fury. Really like this game, pretty quickly, pretty straightforward, and a lot of tactical depth. Thank you for today. And uh, see you soon. Thanks for watching.